same page number, 398, 398. Savior died down where from cleansing for sin I cried there to my heart was the blood applied glory to his name glory to his name glory to his name there to my heart was the blood of Glory to his name. I am so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where he took me in. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. blood applied glory to his name all right on the last verse come to this fountain so rich and sweet cast thy poor soul at the savior's feet Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to His name. Right, turn over to page number 364. There Last verse. 
see you out this morning. Hope everybody's feeling well. Sounds like we're getting showers of blessing outside. All right. No birthdays this week. Anniversaries. Got one slap on today. Mm. <laughs> That's my <Mary> Scott. <laughs> All right. Scott and Tammy Clinton have an anniversary today. How many, Tammy? How many? Twelve. <laughs> All right. Y'all mind standing with saying happy anniversary to you? Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary, God bless you. Happy anniversary to you. All right, Miss Sue, you going to sing? Y'all just pray for me as I try to sing, but before I sing, I want to just praise God. I went to a theater yesterday. It's Narrowway Theater down next to Charlotte, and they had a, the, the, the play was The Fourth Cross, and um, it was marvelous. And The Fourth Cross is our, is our cross. The one that never got dealt, nailed up is our cross because God... Jesus took our sin. He was, he took the cross that we should have taken. And um, the, the guy that played Jesus, the Jesus part, his smile, just his smile, I'm telling you, it could have been Jesus' smile, I think, because he, it just kind of drew you in. And um, he came out and he had all this, you know, fake blood all over him. I don't know what they used, but, I mean, he was covered from head to toe. And I'm thinking, that's not, he was beautiful to what Jesus was when Jesus was in that position. But it was, it was a marvelous thing, and I probably can't sing now. <laughs> I just wanted to praise God that he did take my sin. He did take my cross. I didn't have to go to a cross. I don't have to pay any money. I don't have to, to do anything except just love him and accept his word. And y'all just pray for me as I try to sing. Like I say, I probably can't even see what I'm trying to sing now. But <clears throat> y'all just, just pray real hard. I, I was telling Tammy, I, I practiced last night a song that I was going to sing. Got up this morning, going to practice it, and it was totally. <laughs> <laughs> so the devil's fighting me with this 
singing on Sunday. Um, I, I, I put it off because I did not think my singing was worthy on Sunday morning. Sunday night, you know, different, but Sunday morning is a, is a special time. And I just didn't think it was my singing was worthy of that. But the Lord laid it on me that you got to do this. So the devil's really fighting me with my singing. So y'all just pray for me. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care and bids me at my Father's throne make all my wants and wishes known in seasons of distress and grief my soul has all turned found relief and oft escape the tempter's snare by thy return sweet hour of prayer sweet hour of prayer sweet hour of prayer thy wings shall my petition bear to him whose truth and faithfulness engage the waiting soul to bless and since he bids me seek his face believe his word and trust his grace i'll cast on him my every care and wait for thee sweet hour of prayer sweet hour of prayer sweet hour of prayer may i thy consolation share till from mount pisk gate lofty height i view my home and take my flight this robe of flesh i'll drop and rise to seize the everlasting prize and shout while passing through the air farewell farewell sweet hour of prayer robert was talking this morning about all the benefits that we get for having the lord in our lives and uh, we do we we don't really our minds cannot comprehend all the benefits that we do have so i'll just continue to prayer i can hear my savior calling i can hear my savior calling i can hear my savior calling take thy cross and follow follow me i'll go with him through the garden i'll go with him through the garden i'll go with him through the garden i'll go with him with him all the way where he leads me i will follow where he leads me i will follow where he leads me i will follow i'll go with him with him all the way i'll go with him through the judgment I'll go with him through the judgment. 
I'll go with him through the judgment. I'll go with him, with him all the way. He will give me grace and glory. He will give me grace and glory. He will give me grace and glory. I'll go with him, with him all the way. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'll go with him, with him all the way. I have one more thing, and I'm going to ask everybody to please stand. And let's sing Amazing Grace together, because he does have such amazing grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind. But now I see T'was grace that taught my heart to fear And grace my fears relieved How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believe through many dangers, tolls, and snares I have already come. Tis grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. When we've been there ten thousand years, bright shine. In us the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Thank you. your Bibles this morning. Go with me to the book of St. John, chapter number 13. I'm going to begin a little series for us this morning. We're going to progress through some thoughts on the last of his earthly ministry. We're going to look at some of the last things that our Lord did prior to the crucifixion. Three Sundays from now, well, Counting today, we will celebrate and honor him for his death, burial, and resurrection on Easter Sunday. So we, uh, we're going to be walking towards that in the next several services and some studies uh, that the Lord has begun working in my heart. John chapter number 13, verse number 1 says this, 
Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Now, I'm dealing with the last of his earthly ministry here in John chapter 13, and we go through uh, the end of the book of John covering the last of his ministry. We'll look at some of that as we go forward. Today we're going to look at his last message. Uh, later we'll look at his last mile. We'll look at his lasting mission uh, as we draw a conclusion to this thought that we're looking at and uh, look at some things that the Lord's dealt with. Now don't be alarmed, but we're going to preach through a little bit of chapter 13 and 14 this morning. But I know that you get hungry, so we're not going to stay long with that. But we're going to try to give you some thoughts out of chapter 13. Let's continue reading verse number 2. And the supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father hath given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God. He rises from supper and laid his laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. When then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter said unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, what I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto, him, uh, saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said unto him, He that is washed needeth not to save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but all, not all. For he knew who should betray him, therefore said he, ye are not all clean. So after that he had washed their feet, and had taken his garments, and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done unto you? Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so am I. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to have washed one another. For I have given unto you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. I speak not of you all, I know whom I have chosen, that the scripture might be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it come to pass that when it come to pass, ye may believe that I am he. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me. And he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come before you today. Ask the Lord to cleanse us and purge us. Let nothing be in our mind, heart, or soul that would be a hindrance to thy work through us today. Lord, I ask that the power of God would help us this morning. Lord, that you could move in our hearts. Lord, that you remove from our hearts anything that would be a hindrance to thy work. And Lord, help us to have our minds and our hearts set on thee at this time. Lord, I ask you to please speak to our hearts. Do a work in us, Lord, that will make us different than we've ever been before, for Jesus' sake. Lord, should there be one here this morning or tuned in, Lord, those that's watching with us today, I, I pray, that God, you'll deal with our hearts and their hearts. Should there be one that's unsaved, save them by the marvelous grace of God. Help them to realize that being saved is the greatest day in their life. Lord, it gives us hope of eternity with you rather than an eternal lake of fire that will burn and be that they'll be burned and be tormented forevermore. 
My God, comfort those that are in great need in this hour. We'll thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. As I said, I want to deal with some of the uh, last of his earthly ministry and looking, first of all, at his last message. He says here in verse thirteen, uh, verse 1 of chapter 13 that Jesus knew that his hour has come that he should depart. So Jesus knew that he was finishing up his earthly ministry. The last message that he begins to unfold to the disciples here carries several chapters. But I'm going to deal with a few of those out of chapter 13 and 14 this after this morning uh, before we move forward in some of the things that goes on in the life of his ministry with the disciples. Now this last message, there's several things that stands out to me. And I want to, I want to look at those just a little bit because uh, the Lord here shows us some things that are part of who we should be, how we should conduct ourselves. And I want to share them with us. First of all, we see the example of service in verse number 15. He says, For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done unto you. In this passage, the Lord deals with uh, the disciples in, in recognizing they have called him Lord, they have called him Master, and so is he. He is the Lord. He is the Master. Master is dealing with his teaching that he is the greatest of all teachers. He is the master of the Word of God, the Scriptures. He, he can explain it and, and do an expository of the Scriptures like no one else. Remember the two disciples that walking on the road of Emmaus. And uh, they was depressed and discouraged and, and looked like they was done. But Jesus walks up with them and begins to expound the Scriptures from the beginning of Moses until the crucifixion. And he, he taught them of himself. No greater teacher than Jesus. I like commentaries and commentators. And I like good old taters. But I, anyway, uh, when, you, when you get a hold of some of the studies that these other guys has laid out, man, it's wonderful how they can expose things in the Scriptures, but none greater ever than the Master. Yet this Lord Jesus here as the Master, He says, You also call me Lord, and He is Lord. He is the Lord of all lords. And they were right in calling Him Lord and addressing Him as Lord. And, and such great honor and respect is due unto Him. Yet the Lord laid aside His royal garments, come down put on the robe of flesh, and as you walked among men, here he even lay aside, laid aside his garments there for a time of service. And he got down on his hands and knees and washed the disciples' feet. Now, when you look at this task here, there's no greater example of humility and servitude than this right here. I am not encouraging you to come wash my feet. But Jesus said you ought to heart, have a heart willing to do so. That is the humblest of servitude that can be exemplified by mankind. I, I, just, I just can't imagine the Lord himself kneeling before me to wash my feet. I, I, I'm I, telling you, so many times I identify with Simon Peter. Because I'd have been saying, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, no, you ain't washing my feet. I'd have said that in a heartbeat. And then the Lord explained, well, if I don't wash your feet, you got no part with me. And I'd have said, okay, wash me every whit whole. And he says, well, you're already washed where it's necessary, but this is to show you. He gives an example of this is your contact with this earthen world. Your feet got dirty. They need to be washed and cleaned up. Amen. Good hygiene is always good. Computer didn't break. I ain't froze screen right now. We're just thinking about that. Amen. It's always good to have good hygiene. Amen. Young folk need to be taught that. Older folk sometimes need to be reminded of that. That's not the principle he's showing here. 
He's showing you've had contact with this nasty world that you live in. And you need to come to him and get cleaned up regularly. You have things that enters your ears. You have things that enters your eye gate. And through the eye and the ear gate, they get to the heart. You need to get some of that stuff out of there. So you need to have some time with him and let him wash and clean you up. Ephesians 5 tells us that, that he does that with the washing of the word. What he's saying, what we, we see the example is he's showing we need some time in the word to get cleaned up. Some folk live dirty lives because they don't spend no time in the word. Amen. I, 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 can, I can testify this morning a lack of time in the word will cause you to get dirty. Amen. And that's, that's a necessary thing in our lives. We need to have more time of Bible reading and less time of this social world. Amen. Some folk couldn't live if they couldn't go to Facebook in the morning. I, I'm, I'm telling you, it's, it's, a, it's, it's got a lot of good to it, you know. Sort of like Walmart. Walmart's got good stuff in it and bad stuff in it. Y'all can go all you want to. A uh, preacher, preacher made an example one time years ago. They was being condemning of folks that had computers and because uh, there's so much trash and things that you can get into on uh, computers. That's true. He said, so it is at Walmart. He said, you go into Walmart, you go to one side of Walmart, and there's a, the wine and the beer and all this other kind of junk that you don't need. But I don't go to that section because that's not what I'm in there for. I like real groceries. Sometimes I need uh, office supplies and things of that nature. So I go where I need to go and don't go where I shouldn't go in Walmart. Same thing true on your computers. You can go places you don't need to go. Well, don't go there. Amen? Amen. Keep a check and balance on yourself. Stay away from that stuff. There's all kinds of filthy, nasty stuff out there available that folks can do in the privacy and nobody else know it, so they think. Your immediate folks may not know it, but the world knows it because it doesn't prove that China's watching everything you do on TikTok. And while you're playing around looking at junk on TikTok, they're stealing your information. And you ain't even got a clue. By the way, if you haven't paid attention to news lately, that was just proven for absolute truth this week. They already knew it, but they proved it this week when they set that, that guy from TikTok down before the Congress. So those young folks that think Paul Paul's crazy, it was proven this week, Paul Paul ain't as crazy as you think he is. That's a matter of fact. Matter of fact, it's so bad that they are banning TikTok from being on any of the government uh, computer stuff. Should have been, yeah. Shouldn't, should, shouldn't have never had it on there. But what they do is they use things to entice you to draw you in. You get filthy, dirty, messing around with this world. You need some Jesus time. Last of his earth and ministry, he gives us a very important example of servitude to each other. As I just said, I, I'm not interested in you coming and washing my feet. But you ought to be willing to if God so says to. It's a humbling experience. Now in that setting it's humbling for the Lord of Lords to get down and wash somebody's feet. But it's also humbling to the one that is having their feet washed. So it's both, both sides. It's a humbling experience. I mean could you imagine and I wouldn't want Biden at the house except for so I could preach to him. Amen. Well, could you imagine him coming to your house to wash your feet? Let's think of some of the good fellers that's been there. Let's think of Trump or some of the good guys that's been in there, you know. Reagan. You know, some of them good, good presidents we've had in the past. Amen. Could you imagine someone of a high esteem, a, a very high a position to come to your house and sit down there and wash your feet. 
How about your boss this week? Go in his office, sit down and say, okay, buddy, it's time you wash my feet. You're fired. <laughs> See, you try that with the sheriff this week. See if that works out for you. Yeah, you try that. You tell him your crazy preacher said to try that. Because <clears throat> Matthew or John chapter 13 said so. Amen. So you can try those things. But what a what a servitude. The Lord Himself, here He's showing them an example of how they should do with their fellow man. But when you mark his life in 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 in, in John 6, he fed them. He breaks the bread and the fishes and feeds them. He, he goes on in, 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 in other scriptures in Matthew 10. He furnishes them everything that they need as they go on their journey. He, 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 he fills them with the Spirit in Acts 1 and 2 that they might have the power of God to do things. He, he, does, he does these things in example for what we should be doing. We ought to be helping other fellow brethren and sisters in the Lord. We ought, to be, we ought to be willing to feed them when they need feeding. We ought to be willing to furnish them the supplies and things. that they. By the way, that's faith promise missions. If you ain't part of it, you ought to get in it. Amen. What we do is we help. Hey, Brother Jeremiah has, has had at least, I believe, was it 26, I believe, saved this past week in a revival meeting up in Kentucky. It's amazing that that same number died in the tornadoes in the south. Twenty-six folk went to meet the Lord. Twenty-six folks up in Kentucky got saved. I like the Kentucky work better than I do the other work. Amen? Amen. By the way, Tabernacle Baptist, you got a part of that if you help supply faith promise missions to Brother Jeremiah. We can rejoice this morning that part of our ministry was reaching 26 souls in Kentucky. That's what Faith Promise Missions will do. We're helping our fellow brother go places we can't go. Hallelujah to God. Amen. I love it. Jesus in his last message has given us an example of service. What sets us apart from the world? What makes us different than the world? world doesn't care about everybody else. They're working for self, not for serving. What can I get out of it? Not what you get. See, by the way, that's a good thing about marriage. Real good marriage, a, a, a good marriage is each other serving each other. Hello? A good marriage is each other serving each other. Sir, y'all take her a sweet tea once in a while. Y'all fix her some supper once in a while. Y'all to, to do things for her once in a while. Amen? Y'all like that. And ladies, it works both ways. Amen? Y'all do for him. Amen? Amen? Serving each other is a good marriage. I took my glasses off because I didn't want to see your faces frowning. But I can feel it when I run into a stump. You know what I mean? Sometimes you have to circle that thing with a good John Deere time or two and snatch it out of there. Amen. His last message is an example of service. But he also, in verse 18, he exposes the sellout crowd. While you're doing some great service to others, there's another crowd out there that's selling you out, stabbing you in the back. Y'all know what Judas is doing. You know what the work of Judas is. He's buddying up with that crowd. Hey, how do he know exactly who to go talk to? When he went to sell Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, how did he know who to go see? See, you got to think a little bit further in this thing. He'd been buddying with them along the way. Hey Amen. You watch that crowd. They'll hang around with the wrong ones. Hey Amen. You can mark a man by who he hangs with. Hey Amen. 
Preacher, preacher used to say to us, said, if you hang around with dogs with fleas, you'll get fleas. Amen. Them things will jump off on you. Same thing. What he's saying is you hang around folks with bad character, with bad actions, and you'll pick up on it. You'll have those bad actions. You'll say things alike that they say and you shouldn't be saying. Amen. You pick up on those words that you should not be saying because you're hanging around the wrong folks. Amen. You might have a little number. You might have a small crowd, but I'd rather have a small crowd that's not contaminating me, that's not corrupting me, than to be around a crowd of folks that's making life miserable for me and keeping me out of the graces of God. Amen. Amen. Be careful who you run with. It gets you in a mess of trouble. You got a, you got a few minutes, sit down, Brother Jacob, a little while and ask him how many cases he's dealt with to where some good young'uns got in a mess of trouble because of who they is hanging out with. Is aiding and abetting still part of the law? So if I go with, with Scott and he robbed somebody of a gun, that's what he usually does, because <laughs> if he can't steal it, he don't buy it. But if I go with him and he robs the bank, ain't I guilty of aiding and abetting? So you got to be careful who you're hanging around with. That crowd, that crowd gets you in trouble. Here old Judas has been hanging with that crowd and he ends up selling out the Lord Jesus Christ. Now what we got to look at here, Jesus knew this beforehand. My next point I'm going to deal with is sovereignty a little bit because Jesus knows things folks don't think he knows. But he's selling him out. What did he sell him out for? 30 pieces of silver. That's, that's equivalent to money today. And 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 tells us, For the love, not the having money, but the love of money is the root of all evil. And when you look at evil and what's going on in it, you'll find behind it there's money. And with money, much money, you buy power. What do you think the administration up there at the White House is doing sending money everywhere? They're trying to buy power. They're trying to buy in a friendship, buy their way into some power and controls. Some people think if you got money, you got power. And honestly, it does carry that way a lot in our society. You find somebody that walks in that's known to be a money man or a money woman, folks tend to bend to whatever they ask for. Why? Because they got big money. They make things happen. You better get a Jesus attitude about you and realize regardless of whether they got money or ain't got money, we all walk on level ground. Amen. You take the richest man in Statesville. I don't know who he is. He can walk into certain places and people will honor him in a great way. I got news for you. I can go to the God of heaven that owns everything. And I can call on him and say, Father, I got all I need out there. I got access to the God that owns it all. He can take yours from you quick. They, they, they was some big guy that was stealing money from everybody here in the last several months. He was somehow, some kind of a thing he was running, scam he was running, taking money from everybody, and, and overnight he lost a ton of it. Just boom. I know of a situation that in a year's time lost $100,000 just like that. You can lose a lot of money. I can't lose my sonship. I can't lose my heir to the throne. See, I'm joint heirs with Jesus Christ. I can, I can say, Father and the God of heaven. Boy, that just felt good. I don't know about y'all. Whoa, the God of heaven just heard my cry. And he owns it all. They sold him out for money. When you look at John chapter, look at John chapter 16, verse 33 a minute. John 16, 33, I'll show you a little something here. These things I have spoken unto you that 
in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus is betrayed by Judas. He tells his disciples here in chapter 16, just a, just a few verses or a few moments down the road, he says to them, look, in this world you're going to have tribulation. You're going to have some backstabbers. You're going to have some folks that will sell you out. But be of good cheer. I've overcome that crowd. What they thought was my end, what they thought was my final moments was just the beginning. Calvary was not the end for Christ. It was the beginning for us. That was what made our salvation whole was Calvary. They thought they had him. They thought it was over. And three days later, up from the grave he arose with a mighty trump over his foes. What a Lord we serve. Amen. So we see the exposure to sell out. He knew it was coming. He knew it was going to happen. It wasn't new news for him. But we also see the enlightenment of his sovereignty in verse number 19. He said, now I tell you it before it come to pass, that when it come to pass, you may believe that I am He. He said, I know what's going to happen. That's sovereignty. He talked to Jeremiah. He said, I knew you from your mother's womb. He knew, knew you before you was going to be born. I can't, I can't understand it. Don't need to. Me understanding it don't make it any stronger or any less. It's there and it's real. When he went to Calvary, he knew Curtis would be born November 4, 1964, in case you need my birthday. November 4, 1964, he knew Curtis White would be born. He knew that April the 28, 1972, I'd buy an old-fashioned altar on the Miller Farm Road and say, Lord, save me! He knew these things. Boy, we fret and fear about what tomorrow holds because we forget who holds tomorrow. Amen. Children, there's a lot of stuff going to happen. He tells his disciples, boys, there's tribulation in this world, but be of good cheer. I've overcome. Amen. And since I'm in him and he's in me, I'm going to overcome too. Yeah, we're going to have some sufferings. We're going to go through some teary nights. Hey, but listen, uh, joy comes in the morning. Amen. He's going to be with us. He's going to help us through that because He is sovereign. Isaiah 46, 9 says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. There's a lot of different little gods around the world, but I serve the God, the true, the living, the only one that is able to give life. Amen. In John chapter 1, verse 45 through 48, there's the story where Philip cometh to Nathanael. And the Lord tells Nathanael, said, I knew thee when you sat under the tree before Philip came. What is that? That's sovereignty. What he's saying is God is saying, the Lord Jesus is saying, I knew you before you ever knew who I was. Amen. Children, take, take good heart in it this morning. He knew you. Before the day came. Amen. And he knows what's coming tomorrow. Amen. And since he's the planner. Since he's sovereign. He's done set up tomorrow the way it needs to be for you. He's going to take good care of you. Amen. He's already got a good plan. Now here's the problem that we have. He has a good plan laid out for us. But sometimes we take the wrong turn. We get on roads that he didn't have planned for us. We in, in, invite troubles into our lives that we should not be experiencing because we didn't go the road that he wanted us to follow. Amen. You better stay in the will of God. Amen. In the will of God, there's protection, there's providence, and there's peace. Out of it, there's problems. In the will of God, there's protection, there's peace, and there's providence. Out of it, there's problems. I listened to a testimony last night of a gentleman talking about he'd got out of wheel. I believe, I believe it was Facebook. 
preacher was talking about he had got out of the will of God and how he had went so many years and he was out of the will of God and he just had problem on top of problem on top of problem and he just kept paying and paying and paying. He said, finally one day and I got right with the Lord. He said, I sat down. He said, I figured up my lack of tithe. I figured up my problems. And he said, I know you ain't going to believe, but he said, I believe that's the way he said it. Anyway, he said, my amount of problems, the cost thereof matched the amount of tithes that I had not paid. I don't know that it always works out that way, but it did for him. Sometimes we invite troubles because we take the wrong path. God's got a plan. And if we'll follow his plan, he'll take care of things. Well, preacher, I just can't afford to tithe. Honey, you can't afford not to. Amen, Miss Kay. You can't afford not to. That widow woman said, I've got one meal left for me and my son. The preacher said, feed me first. And she never had an empty barrel. She had one meal left is her testimony. One meal left. But the, for the duration of that famine, she never one time had an empty barrel. Why? Because she done what God told her to do. We invite problems into our lives because we don't follow God's plan. See, he's sovereign. He knows what's out there. And he's going to provide those things that's needful for us when we obey what he said for us to do. Our failure in tithing sometimes is very costly. Now, what that preacher said was not all the way correct. Here's what I need you to understand. I don't know how many years he was out of God's will. I don't know how long the duration was there. But what he figured up that he paid out, not one dime of that paid a tithe. So let's just use a number. Let's say he was $1,000 behind in his tithe and he paid $1,000 out in problems. Y'all with me? He still ain't paid no tithe. So he paid out that thousand. He still owed God that tithe. Amen. God ain't satisfied just because you had to pay, pay for a problem that you caused yourself. Amen. You won't make it right with God? Give him his thousand that you owe him. Amen. That's the way you do it. That's the way it's right. Amen. Amen. It, it, let's say I owe you a hundred dollars. And on the way to your house to give you a hundred dollars, I blow a tire. Everybody in here knows a tire is going to cost you about a hundred dollars. You can pay $200 for it, but you're going to pay at least about $100 for a tire. Well, I stop and have to put a tire on an XL tire. It cost me $100. And I call you up and I say, hey, buddy, I'm sorry. I had to spend your 100 on that tire. How are you going to feel? I still owe you $100, right? So that's the same way it works with God. You still owe. Got to get it right. I went several years one time without that. And I don't know why I'm on tide, but I am. So let's do it. Uh, I went several years and didn't tithe. was out of church for a little bit. I got back in church, and God had worked out something in my life to where I had an extra amount of money. I took that extra amount of money and gave every dime of it to God because I know that I had went so many years without paying tithe, and I was trying to get it right. I'd done the absolute best I can with what money I had left. And God honored it. I couldn't, I couldn't pay all that right then. I didn't have all that. But what I did have, I gave. And God in heaven forgave and honored that. And I did what I, I got where I could be with the Lord. Amen. Sovereignty. John 16, 13. He says, now, the, the disciple says, now we sure, now are we sure that thou knowest all things. Simon Peter said to the Lord in John 21, he said, Lord, thou knowest all things. God knows all things. You hear me this morning? God knows everything. Every thought you've had, every desire you've had, the want to to do right, the want to to do wrong, God knows everything. Everything. God knows. That's his sovereignty. In verse 35, John chapter 13, verse 35, let me hurry. We're going to be done here in a minute. He says in this, he says, 
Uh, verse 34 says, The new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Now stop a minute and think. I want you to think just for a moment on how good Jesus has loved you. You think about the love that Jesus has gave you. Now, according to your King James Bible, he says right here, as I have loved you, I want you, as I have loved ye, that ye also love one another. So the love that Jesus gave you, he wants you to give to one another. See, you do that and we, we, we lessen our problems in the world, in our churches, in our families. If we'll love one another the way Jesus has loved us. Preacher, you don't know what they've done to me. What did you do to Jesus? Let's, let's have a little talk. If you want to talk about what they've done to you, let's come over here a minute and let's have a little talk about what you've done to Jesus. Let's talk about how you responded to Jesus. How many long nights did he call on you to accept him as Savior and you push him away? How many times has he offered you blessings and called you to come closer and you push him away? Are you totally 100% in the perfect will of God right now? God's dealt with you about doing something or not doing something and you refuse or disobey? And you want to compare how someone else has treated you? Think about how we've treated Jesus. Gave us everything. Stretched out his arms on Calvary and took our place. Took that middle cross for us. Where I should be hanging, where I should have died, the death of a guilty sinner, a transgressor of the law of God, I should have died. Jesus took my place. Took my place. Save me from a devil's hell. And then gave me all the benefits. He didn't just save me. If he saved me from hell and I died and went to the earth and that was the end of me, it would still be good to be saved. But I don't go to the earth and just decay away. I, I, I get revived with the life of God in me for all eternity. Now, I don't just get to go to heaven and look at it. I got a set of keys, and I was about to get upset with you this morning, Brother Robert. You kept trampling all over my sermon back there in your Sunday school lesson. He started over there to John 14, and I said, mm -mm. You know, it's amazing how the Lord lines up stuff when you had no idea whatsoever that what I was going to be dealing with this morning, neither did I know what you was. What's God trying to tell us? we got a home in heaven. Amen. He gave us. Amen. I'm paying for the house I'm living in on Jennings Road, on uh, White's Farm Road, Shoemaker Drive. I'm paying for that house. He gives me the strength and the abilities to earn the money to pay for it. I'm paying for that one. I got one over yonder he paid for totally 100%, and it's waiting on me. Can I tell y'all a secret? You don't even need a key to it. We ain't locking no doors over there. Y'all silly. Ain't going to be no need locking no doors. Ain't going to be no thieves over there. Be no robbers, no murderers. Be no perverted folks over there. It's heaven. We're going to walk down a street of gold to a beautiful mansion. I can't, I honest, I'm honest, I can't imagine it. I try, but my imagination compares it to something here, and that ain't nowhere close. Trump Village down there at the end of Brawley School Road, there ain't nothing down there even close. And we looked at one that was, was it four million? Four, four million dollars for a house down there, and there wasn't enough land hardly to, to mow. You hear me? It's house. Yeah, weed eats all you about to get to do down there. Four million dollars. Ain't even close to what I got over yonder. Because we rode down a paved road, wasn't it? 
concrete sidewalks. Mine's gold. Gold, friend. I can't imagine what the house looks like. Can't even get my mind to work around it. It's absolute perfect. Because Jesus built it. Jesus built my house. He's prepared a mansion for me over there. Man, what a Savior we serve. Man. And see, because of that, we have an effective sonship. He says in verse 34, I want you to love others like I've loved you. Don't answer, but think. Have you loved others the way Jesus loved you? Then at altar call time, you ought to ask the Lord to forgive you for not doing what he commanded us to do. That's not an ask. That's a command. See that? A new commandment I give you. He wrote a law and said for you to abide by it. I want you to love other people like I have loved you. That's big. That's hard to do right there. Then he says, verse 35, he said, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. See, that's, that's an effective sonship. Because you're his disciple, because you're his son, you're having an effect on others. That's an effective sonship. He's given us a message about having an effective and effective sonship. You want an effective sonship? Love others like Jesus loved you. Preacher, you don't know what they did. I, I don't. Sometimes, sometimes I do. But Jesus says to love them like he loved us. That's tough, ain't it? See, we're, we're to per, portray his perfect work in us. That perfect work is love. A lot of folks, and I kid about this sometimes with the family, we cut up and say this. I, I kid Judy with it because she, you know, everything she says, she, I love you. She don't say bye. She says, love you, see you later, whatever. She says, love you. I said, well, you tell everybody that. You know why? Because she means it. A lot of folks just throws the word out. Instead of saying bye or see you later, they say, love you. They hit the road. Do they love you, really? Love you? Or are they just using a word to be comfortable? comforting because Jesus says I'm showing you an example of what love is and I want you to use that example to live a life that others know you are my disciple by the love that we expose to others do they know we're the disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ so an effective sonship he also gave them in his message an encouragement during the Separation, chapter 14, verse 1 through 3. We know this. That's usually a funeral message, but it's not really a funeral message. It's a message of encouragement from Jesus to the disciples and to us. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, you may be also. So we see the encouragement during separation. What's he doing? He's preparing us a place. And he's given us a promise of return. You believe other parts of the Bible, right? We believe John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. We believe that, that God is saved. Well, he says here, if it's not so, I would have told you it ain't so, but I'm going to prepare you a place. So in your time of separation from Him, and y'all know what I'm talking about, bodily separation, physical separation, not spirit. In this time of separation, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And there's the promise that he'll return. We've got the promise. We, 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 we look at this and we comfort our own hearts oftentimes by knowing that he's preparing something greater for us 
and he's promised us that he will return. That promise gives us encouragement because we know we get to see our other brothers and sisters and friends and family that's gone on before us. What a happy re reunion day we have. He gives us encouragement during our separation, chapter 14, 1 through 3. But he gives us, he talk, tells them in the message there, there's the entrance of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God's coming in verse 16. He tells them that I'm going to go away, but I'm going to send you a comforter. I, I, I pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you for a little while. That's not what the Bible says. It says that he may, may abide with you forever. He doesn't put any conclusions. He doesn't put any conditions. Nothing you can do to change it. You've got the Holy Ghost forever. That's the Spirit of God dwelling in you. See, we have the promise of the entrance of the Spirit of God in the message that he gives his disciples. He's, 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 he's leading them into greater things. He's got much greater. He's going to talk to them about some more things in a little bit. And it's hard to say that it's going to be greater, but he's got more things he needs to say to them. But he's telling them, look, I'm going to leave, but I'm going to send you my Spirit. I'm going to give you a comforter. He gives them the promise of his presence. He gives them the promise that it's permanent. He gives them the promise that it's peaceful in verse 26. But the comforter, that means he's bringing you peace. That means you're going to have problems. You're going to have tribulations. But I'm going to give you a comforter. He's going to give you comfort in those times. He's going to help you to know it's going to be all right. One of the greatest ex explanations I have or examples of that I've had in my life was when I had cut my artery in two of my arms. I was laid over at the hospital, and they wasn't doing a whole lot, and we was really concerned whether I was going to lose my arm because it went in there and cut things apart, and we didn't know what was going to happen, and they wasn't doing much, and we couldn't make do much, but uh, God the Holy Ghost showed up in the room. And he gave us comfort. And we're sitting there enjoying the presence of God with my arm an artery laid wide open and bloody mess. And the doc comes back in me and hers are weeping. He said, what happens? Everything all right? What? You know, it scared him. He didn't know what was going on. And we said, we're doing just fine, doc. Jesus done showed up. Holy Ghost done give us comfort. We had a problem, but he gave us comfort in that problem. That's God. Just dealt with that little deal with Titus. Big deal, really. God the Holy Ghost gives comfort in those times. Thankful for the comfort, the presence of the Spirit of God. It's a permanent. It's peaceful. He gives us that as a performance. When you look at, look at verse 23, he says, If any man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and, will, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. See, there he is all over my stuff this morning there, Brother Robert. He's going to come set up home with us. How can we have a worry or a, a problem that's too big to, to, to have comfort with when Jesus is here? Because we like him disciples. A little storm rose up. Jesus is laying in the uh, hull of the boat, sleeping, taking it easy. Well, if he's at rest, what we got to worry about? You can't sink a boat with the one that made the water laying in it. Hello? How are we going to go down when we got the master of the sea with us? But we, like the disciples, oftentimes when troubles come, we get disturbed, we get disoriented, we get discouraged. <clears throat> and we need the Holy Ghost to bring us to comfort. It's going to be all right. Even in times of separation, even in times of sorrow, Somehow or another, the Holy Ghost can bring us that comfort we need. He give us promise. He give us the Holy Ghost for performance. Because he said, if you love me, you keep my words. Now, how can we keep the commands of God? We a bunch of wicked, no good for nothing sinners. How are we going to keep the word of God and the commandments of God? Because he's going to give us that what we need through the Holy Ghost in performance. See, when you look in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he's going to give us that power that's necessary with the Holy Ghost. 
I can't perform the things that's before me that I need to do. I, 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 I can't feed a multitude of folks the word that they need today, but God knows how to put it together. And God knows how to use a little old nobody to feed a whole bunch of somebodies. You think that, you think that lad with a few loaves and a few fishes on the side of a, a bank was just a little old pretty story to read? No. There's an example there to show you that a little old lad that has no ability to feed a crowd of 5,000 plus in the hands of Jesus and his power, he can feed them all. So little old me, like a little old lad, I ain't got much to offer, but somehow or another the Lord can take it and he can break the bread. You know, the old timers used to say of service, preaching time, he said, we're going to come now to the time for breaking of the bread. Some of you folk ain't old enough to remember that. I remember that. I guess that makes me old now. You're following right close behind me. He's got a kid fixing to graduate college, so he's getting old. Breaking the bread? What do you mean breaking the bread? Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Jesus said, I am the Word. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So the breaking of bread is the breaking of the Word of God. That means the sharing of the Word of God. That's what the preaching time is. We come in here to eat of Him, to get the nourishment, the, 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 the power, the strength that we need from His Word to help us go on, to give us that comfort that we need. See, he, he talks to us about our being able to perform because he told us, Philippians 4, 19, I can do all things through, through Christ Jesus which strengthens me. It ain't about what I can do. It's about what he can do through me. It's about what he can do using me. God has empowered every one of us. Well, I pray I just can't hardly do. You can't do no more than God will let you do. But God will show enough to give you power to do if you'll say, yes, Lord, I will. God will use you if you'll let him. I'll get personal just a minute with you, Brother Robert. I don't want to embarrass or cause any stirring of old feelings, but wasn't there a time just a few years ago you thought you would never be able to do anything again? When your body failed you, didn't you think, I can't, I'll never be able to? What would you do this morning? Taught Sunday school. Amen. Sung us a little song. And blessed a hound out of my heart. See, a lot of folk thinks it's all about the right, and the, please don't take this wrong. It ain't all about just pretty piano playing and pretty music. It's about a touch of God. And regardless of who we are, whether we're in tune or whether we're singing it uh, perfected and, and everything, the tempo's right and all, it ain't got to do It's about God's touch. And when you sing and obey God, God touches it. That little old lad didn't have but a few fishes and a few pieces of bread, but he fed 5,000 plus. What is that? God will take what you give and use it in a great way. Amen. God, God, if you know, if, if you knew what this church has been through financially over the last several years, You'd wonder how in the world we still got the doors open. And we have wondered that, haven't we, Miss Angela? <laughs> how are we going to make it? And God somehow does. Stay faithful. Stay in it for Jesus and let him use you. He'll do great things. Jesus gave these boys a message in his last hours. He said, I want you to be an example. Let me show you what you need to do. I want you to serve each other. See, we're not here for service to us, but to serve others. That's where the problem comes. When you get to the place of others serving you, you've got the wrong attitude. I don't care what position you carry. As a pastor, I don't look at folks to serve me. I look as it as an opportunity to serve you. And that's the attitude we all should have. Jesus said, they'll know you're my disciples because you got love one for another. He gave them a pretty good message there as a last message. 
couple chapters long, but it's got a lot of good stuff in it. We'll deal with some more of it as we travel through these verses over the next few days. My, what a message. He taught us much about servitude. He taught us about his sovereignty. You're not going through anything God didn't already know about. And tomorrow will be no different. And his comfort and his care and his, his uh, fulfilling what you need is not going to change. Not one bit. But preacher, you don't know what's come over me. I may not. Jesus does. And he's already made providences. He's already had it in his plan to take care of exactly what you need to carry you through that. It's raining. You ain't going to go nowhere anyway. See, Jesus, Jesus has got a plan. I don't always understand how come things go the way they do when some people are as good as gold, it seems like, and they're so kind and compassionate and, and heart-filled of giving, and they're just such good folk, and then they go through such terrible times. I don't always understand that, but I do know this. God said that he'd give them the grace they needed the same as anybody else. The harder the problem, the more the grace. And His grace is sufficient for our every need. We see folks with physical needs, but we often don't see the spiritual needs. Paul walk up to us, we'd see that he's got some physical problems with his eyes. That glow of Jesus on the road to Damascus Changed his eyesight forever, physically and spiritually. Get a hold of this. Lord, just give me this. He saw less of the world and more of Jesus. Glory. We think, oh, poor old pitiful Paul can't see much no more. Yeah, he can. He sees a lot more of Jesus and a lot less of the world. But we wouldn't see that messenger of Satan that was sent to buffet him every day. See, folks, we forget. We don't realize what other folks may be fighting. They may be fighting devils of all kinds. But remember, the Lord can use that to keep you humble and to keep you helpful. Without that, you may rise to a place of pride that causes your great destruction. So rather than saying, oh, I hate I got this, oh, I hate I got this, may say, thank you, Lord, for keeping me humble and let me be helpful. Somebody else may be going through something that may not seem to be as bad as what you got, but God's given you grace to keep going on. And you could share that with them and say, you know, God's given, I've got such and such going on, but God's given me grace. They may be a sinner and going through things and not know nothing about the grace of God. And listen to your story and know more about your situation and say, wow, if, if God can do that for him or God can do that for her, maybe that's the God I need. Maybe that's what's missing in my life. And through your going through suffering, God lets you be an example and share the love of God with someone that's undeserving but so needed. They may come to know Jesus just because of what you went through. I, I don't know all the circumference that goes with Nikki's situation. I, I don't know. But I do know this. I've been around enough doctors and nurses and people in the hospital that has seen God Almighty working through her little old life. That as bad as it's been, she has been a great tool to touch hearts. This last visit that she went through down in Charleston, she has so impacted the doctors and the nurses there. And I was there with them, and, and I was so honored and so humbled. 
we had had prayer because I've sort of been around enough, y'all know, uh, to sort of sense when they're coming to get you. I can see the rustling and see the nurses working and know that they're fixing to come get you, take you to surgery. I seen it coming, and I said, we need to pray. So we took time and had prayer. Then a few minutes, the doctor's helper come in, and then the doctor come in. and She said, well, y'all need to go ahead and do your bye kisses and say goodbyes and all that. Said, so we're fixing to take her in. The doc steps in. Said, yeah, you know. I said, well, we already took time and had prayer with her. The doctor looked at me and said, would you pray for me? One of the top neurosurgeons in America. From some foreign land over here doing neurosurgeries. One of the top best in the land. That's why she was there instead of up here one of the best that could do what had to be done in her. Looked at little old Curtis and said, will you pray for me? And I didn't pray to some foreign God. I didn't pray to some false God. I prayed to the God of heaven. And he stood there and held my hand while we prayed. And I, I felt unity there. I'm just telling you, I could feel a union with him. I can feel the spirit bearing witness, if you want to use that term. Well, he just felt like brothers. I never met the guy. never seen him before in my life. But because little Miss Nikki's going through all kinds of troubles and trials, all about her is people that's watching. A little youngin, I, I know she's grown up. Nikki, don't get mad at me. But in my heart, she's still my little girl. And I see her laying there going through all the pain and trouble. I see all the folks gathered around watching her go through this. And she slip up that little and she just prays, Lord, God is good. Somebody going through what she's going through and she says, God is good. What is it? It's grace. Comfort from the Holy Ghost. God, let that work through her troubles to touch others' hearts. You don't know what God might do with what you've got. Until you give it to him. Here's what I got, Lord. It ain't much. But I want you to use it for your glory. You'll be amazed what God can do with you today. If you'll surrender. If you'll just surrender. You don't know how many days you got left. Here in a short time, I'm going to go over here to, to Beulah and honor a dear friend. His wife returned home the other day and found him dead. 53 years old, I believe. Young man. You never know when your time is done. You never know when God's going to call you home. Why don't you, why don't you today, why don't you just put it all on the altar and say, God, I ain't got much, but here's what I am, here's what I got. Will you use me? to help some old sinner see you as a Savior? Would you use me to help encourage and comfort some old saint that's going through the storms? Here I am, my Lord. Use me. Will you mind God this morning? Father, in Jesus' name, help us obey you. Have thine will Save the sinners. Strengthen the servants of God. I pray it in Jesus' name. You mind the Lord, this altar's open. Give your little bit to God and watch what He can do with it.
would, get your hymnals. Turn to page 394. Turn to 394. I want you to stand with me and sing this this morning. I don't have it with me, Clarence. It's in the office. Three ninety four. I pray that God will help this not be just some melody that we sing, but it'll be your heart. All oh, to Jesus I surrender. All oh, to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him. In his presence daily live, I surrender all, I surrender all, all to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Listen to verse 2. All to Jesus I surrender, humbly at his feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken, take me Jesus, take me now. I surrender all, I surrender. I surrender, make me your holy thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit truly know that thou art mine. I surrender all, I surrender. I surrender, Lord, I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power. Let Thy blessings fall on me. I surrender all. I surrender. I surrender all. Amen. God bless you. I'll see you at six. What do you need, Clarence? All right. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. We ask you specifically that you would touch and help Miss Nikki today. God, you know the problem and you know the pain that she's dealing with. And Father, we pray that God in mercy in your love and in your grace and according to thine power that you'll touch her little body. God, give her relief of that pain and help her today, I pray. Please touch Miss Anita and give her the grace and comfort and help that she needs. And Father, we thank you for what you're doing. We ask it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right, God bless you. I'll see you at 6.